it, we're, we're pretending he said something worse than he did. That's something that has been concerning me a little bit in the ex-Mormon world. When you leave the moral framework of Mormonism, sometimes you let go of some principles and ideas that, even though they're found in Mormonism, they're not unique to Mormonism, but they're still really important for us to get along in the messiness of life, and forgiveness and grace are a big part of that. The fact that we have a rising generation that is struggling with very difficult questions and are looking for answers. I do, I do worry as you do. And it, it will dissolve friendships, it will dissolve families, it will dissolve organizations. Yes. Because it is just, you cannot exist in an organization that has that mindset. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Midnight Mormons. I'm your host, Cardin Ellis, and today I am joined via Zoom with several friends here to talk about the most recent controversy with uh, Brad, Brad Wilcox here. Uh, let's welcome Brad Whitbeck, Kwaku L, Jim Bennett, and none other than Jonathan Streeter to the studio. Everybody say hi. Hey. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that was uh, that was that, that we could do better. I'll edit that part out. But oh, anyway, um, aloha. Yeah, yeah aloha. <laughs> there it is. Um, so anyway, uh, just so everybody knows, this whole conversation got started because of the dog pile, as you called it, Jonathan, on uh, Brad Wilcox. And you sent me a really interesting text where you just simply said, hey, I don't like this dog pile that's happening on Brad Wilcox. And then we had a great conversation. Tell us your thoughts. You're the first one to speak, go. Well, it was really a reaction to a tweet that Kwaku sent out. I don't know if it was a tweet or a comment on uh, Twitter or Reddit, but um, it was actually, I came across it in the ex-Mormon Reddit where there was a lot of people responding emotionally to the comments of Brad Wilcox. And one of them put a screen capture of Kwaku essentially saying, hey, Brother Wilcox, you know, everybody has a bad day. They, you know, say things without thinking. I forget the exact verbiage of it. Um, I could look it up, but it was essentially, it ended with, you know, even as a black Mormon, I forgive you. And even, you know, basically I'm going to treat this like Christ told me, which is 70 times seven. And as Kwaku frequently does, he turns it into like a little branding thing right there. But the whole 70 <laughs> times seven, if, if, you know, that concept in and of itself speaks to the grace and forgiveness that is characteristic of people who follow Christ. But the, the tweet that Kwaku read was, uh, you've been an amazing teacher and leader for years. You're not defined by one bad moment. We all have bad moments. Christ told us 70 times seven, love and support you from your black brother in the gospel. And this was being used to kind of do what frequently is done, where you kind of make fun of black people who are in the church for being, um, for having false consciousness or internalized racism. Kwaku converted. That's like some serious internalized Hatred. But at any rate, what it spoke to me, though, is it it showed me that even somebody who could have every reason to turn this into a weapon against Brad Wilcox, being a black person in the church, uh, calling on the Christian principle of forgiveness and grace to kind of step away from the mob mentality that's taking over in trying to demonize Brad for all of this. And that's something that has been concerning me a little bit in the ex-Mormon world, when you leave the moral framework of Mormonism, sometimes you let go of some principles and ideas that even though they're found in Mormonism, they're not unique to Mormonism, but they're still really important for us to get along in the messiness of life. And forgiveness and grace are a big part of that. And just the turn of the phrase of 70 times seven, 
meaning that you want to be over and abundant with the amount of forgiveness that you give people around you. And there's a reciprocal element to that because you also want to be forgiven. And, you know, I've posted stuff that Brad Wilcox has said inarticulately and quite offensively in various stuff on my own channel. And I usually post it without comment. But the idea is that the ideas that he's talking about, you can respond to without demonizing the person himself. And in most of the stuff that we've seen, like in Mormon Stories podcast, um, there's a lot of noise made about, well, we're, we're, not, we're separating Brad Wilcox from the institution. It's about institutions and systems, not about people. And it, there's just, even though they say that, you can hear in his second apology that he's really busted up. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, white man's tears, who cares about all that stuff? But um, like you don't want to turn into a monster while you're trying to advocate for change in the church or for better principles to come out. And I just think that there needs to be at least a moderating voice saying, you know, we don't need to go that far into that direction. His wife's name has been brought into this. Like, you know, if your wife is standing up for you, give your wife a pass. Like there's no reason to go and try to just problematize everybody dealing with all this stuff. And I, I could go on for a while for this, so I don't want to, uh, well, no, well, please, sure please do go on. The only thing I'll interject right now is actually I love the phrase you said, um, don't turn into a monster, because um, I was actually a backlot studio tour guide at uh, Universal Studios on the NBC Universal backlot. And I'm a huge Universal Movie Monsters fan. So I used to love it when we go through this uh, this set of sets called Little Europe because they actually had filmed uh, the old Dracula and the old Frankenstein movies there. And there was these clips we could show on the screen so that the audience could see how these sets to our right, only 50 feet away, would show up on the silver screen mm. when used mm -hmm. in movies. And m one of my favorite clips was literally called Grab Your Torches and Pitchforks and Go. And it was a montage of all the times the villagers had grabbed all of their pitchforks and their torches and stormed Frankenstein's castle. Yeah. And if you actually watch Frankenstein, it's a wildly touching film. When they gang up on him in that final windmill scene. And, and you see the village not understanding the angst of the monster and just viewing him as just a monster of no inherent value, no conditional worth, no Christ-like value of seven times 70, nothing. And they're just going to grab their torches and go against him. You all of a sudden find yourself empathizing with the monster that just almost tried to kill a child. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And and so I do I do worry as you do we can't develop this attitude as a society. And when you texted me, I, I love what you said where you said, I'd rather be on this team than the one with the pitchforks. I don't want to put words in your, your mouth. So so, so tell me where I went wrong. But well, it was something like that. One of the things that I've been exploring on my own channel is the history of the great proletarian cultural revolution in China. And that was a movement where young people adopted an ideology which allowed them to demonize people if they had wrong think. And they were specifically told to take old customs, old traditions, old ideas, and anybody who would say them or anything that represented them were basically unpersoned and a great deal of violence was committed on them. There were, there were high school students and middle school students who literally beat, tortured, and murdered their teachers because they felt that their teachers represented the bourgeoisie or, or bad thinking in the, in the ideology of the day. But there's this element within mob movements where you get a puritanical moral dimension to something and then you can demonize it, you can label somebody with it, and then you end up going far further than you would normally go because you get a personal sense of righteousness out of doing that. And that's an impulse that exists in all of us um, it exists in you guys. I see it when you go against John DeLynn. Many times you go further than I think you would reasonably go if it was whoa, somebody whoa. that you under knew. Jonathan, we've yeah. never done anything wrong ever once. <laughs> never. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, not but not but it's one of those no, things where you just totally have to right. constantly be aware of it. You have to check yourself very frequently. And I feel like that impulse to check yourself and say, wait a second, is this what I stand for? Is this what I really believe is lost? And, and particularly like Brad Wilcox, is he's a goofy guy he is on the talk circuit and he has an energy that is kind of that geeky nerdy mormon energy that is why he's so popular even though i find it 
a little bit grating, but he's known like the way I knew Brad Wilcox is this was a guy who was able to speak to the Christian message of grace in a way that few general authorities can, in a way that diffuses the perfectionism, the toxic perfectionism that a lot of Mormons have, and somebody who actually has the, the ability to make the gospel much more human in the way that he conveys it, in the way he gives people the ability to conceptualize the gospel. So there's like, he would be considered a good guy if you're trying to soften what some people turn into the harder edges of the gospel. And so knowing that that's his background, I tend to give him a little bit more leeway in the things that he says. Now, to be sure, he touched on a lot of different topics that are very pertinent to today and that affect people's lives a lot. And he is repeating things that are very common from a decade and a decade and a half, two decades ago and, you know, centuries before then. But you know, not everybody gets to the, that point at the same time. And you want to make sure if somebody's going to evolve and change that you're helping them there and they see you with doing that with kindness rather than, you know, coming at him the way that he's really been approached this way. And, you know, I'm going to get flack because you're just basically saying if you don't take the most extreme point possible in the ideological perspective of how we approach this issue, then you are bad yourself. And it's one of those things that tends towards more radicalized behavior, a more radicalized way of treating these things. And so ex-Mormons who watch this are going to be like, well, Streeter's turning code. He's turning, you know, he shouldn't be showing. You've got to call out all of this injustice, all of these bad things. And I'm happy to have a conversation about why those things are bad. I just don't want to lose the humanity of Brad the humanity of me and how I treat him or talk about him. I want to be as graceful, charitable, and forgiving as possible in the discussion while I still say, you know, a lot of the things that he said reflect ways of thinking that he clearly hasn't really, you know, reflected too deeply on. And so I can talk a lot on, uh, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, no, <that>. Quaku, <laughs> Quaku. I mean, he was talking about your tweet, man. Jump in. Well, yeah. So, um, you know, I think that, well, first, I think it's a Trojan horse. I think, I don't think this is about Brad Wilcox. I think this whole Brad Wilcox thing is really, it's it's another vehicle to push what feels like this new, I, there's a million terms you can use. Some people call it secular humanism. Some people call it wokeism, radical leftism, whatever you want to call it. But I saw the same political colors painted on the on this flag you know, of, of demolition against Brad Wilcox, which has really ended up always being, by the way, the brethren are bad. And to me, it's just, I would rather you just come out and say that. So we all I'm glad I'm not the only the one way. with the crappy internet now. Or maybe <laughs> I am. <laughs> Actually, I was like to say, that is you, Jonathan. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, first, it, we're, we're pretending he said something worse than he did. All right. Because the first I heard about this, everybody was freaking out. Every every suburban mom and, and UVU sociology major was freaking out about this. And so I, as the black person, wanted to check it out. And I was like, eh, all right. OK, it was it was kind of it was kind of dumb, but it's not the end of the world. All right. If he got up there and he was like, you know what? If they weren't descendants of Cain, this wouldn't be a problem. Like if he had said something <laughs> like that, I would be like, oh, my goodness. But he said the the maybe we're asking the wrong question was him trying to say maybe let's not look at this from the most pessimistic view ever but let's examine why priesthood has been has been given to certain people throughout history from genesis to 2022 that's the message he was trying to convey he didn't convey it very gracefully but it's he wasn't being heinrich himmler this was not some horrific you know robert bird speech and so I'm like, this isn't that. And so then I see all these people who are like, I have never been more horrified and offended in my life. That it's like this, is, you, there is so much hyperbole going into, in, in the review of what he said for a specific goal. You go look up Brad Wilcox on YouTube and you, you go to the, 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 the sort by this month. Every single YouTuber and podcaster who has a channel critical of the church has been making content about this nonstop. And money. Like, this is a cash flow for people. 
The, yeah. The TikTok, this is crazy. And by the way, every single person outside, who, like like mainstream Christians or people who just have never been LDS, are going like an old uh, an old an old Mormon dude said something slightly <laughs> insensitive in a chapel. Okay. Yeah, but I can't help but notice that the same people that seem to be defending that seem to be defend uh, or, or going after Wilcox ruthlessly are the same people that also fervently push forward a man who was friends with Robert Byrd, a KKK leader, and said the N-word like 35 times while holding political office and pushed laws that put more black people in prison, Joe Biden. So I've all, I'm just a little confused by this, by the switcheroo. I'm confused by you should never, ever be racially insensitive. And if you do, you should be canceled, fired from your job, and shunned from society. I'll also vote for someone who's done worse. Okay, I'm totally fine with that. And the minute you defend this youth fireside religious professor at a university you don't really care about except for during football season, I'm going to come after you. I don't understand the worldview. If the worldview is this hyper-wokeism that's saying we need to be allies to everything, then how come it's not consistent? Why is it always one rule for me, another for thee? And then when it is another for thee, why is it so hyperbolized and over-examined? And why do we have the most condescending thought leaders I've ever seen come out with these long laments of, well, I, I appreciate the apology, but what your apology is lacking, like they have a long French cigarette, you know, sipping Chardonnay, <laughs> judging this. It's just the most ridiculous thing ever. I do not understand the consistency. I did not think it was that big of a deal. And I'm sorry, at some okay. point, this is a moneymaker. If you're making this many TikToks and videos about it, you know it's a moneymaker. You know you're getting likes and you're getting a dopamine rush off of the destruction of a 50-something-year-old man because of something slightly insensitive he said three times in a fireside you did not care about until you saw the TikTok. So I don't know. It's not that big of a deal to me. <laughs> okay, so Jim. Jim, where does where does Quaku go wrong here? You're friends with all these anti-Mormons. You know, it, <laughs> you know you, if there's somebody that hates the church and has a blog, you've already sipped coffee, caffeine-free coffee with them at least three oh, times. Uh, so, so where does Quaku go wrong in all of this, my friend? Well, I want to start with where Quaku went right, which oh. is that it's not about Brad Wilcox. At least it's not for me. Uh, and we talked about this at length, so I don't know how much I, I'm going to repeat myself in, from the previous podcast. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't have any stomach for any kind of vilification of Brad Wilcox as a human being. Uh, I think Jonathan's point there is certainly well taken. Uh, and, and for me, uh, this has nothing to do almost with Brad Wilcox as a human being. And it really doesn't have a whole lot to do uh, with uh, Brad Wilcox misspeaking. Uh, it has to do, so So I, this is where I think Kwaku is going to paint me as the guy with the long French cigarette. I've never <laughs> smoked anything, but, uh, I, you know, I could start with the French ones. Um, I, I don't even know. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> um, um, uh, uh, I Because I posted on, on his Facebook page. And my frustration with this is that Brad Wilcox, I mean, one, one, of, the, one of the popular things to say now is that he said the quiet part out loud. Uh, but Brad Wilcox is, is repeating a sort of apologetic uh, explanation for the priesthood and temple ban that uh, was considered, I think, sort of the general conventional wisdom of the church for a great deal of time and for most of Brad Wilcox's life. And, you know, I, and I get very frustrated when it's like, well, he just misspoke. He said something inartfully. I mean, he's been giving the same talk for three years. I mean, that's one of the things that's been propping up is it's like, this is not something he just said off the cuff. This is something that he has said over and over and over again. And the problem is not that Brad Wilcox is a bad person and needs to be canceled. The problem is that we are far too eager to throw God under the bus in defense of Brigham Young or in defense of racism in the church. Uh, we are not willing to confront head on the problematic mistake of the priesthood ban, of the temple restriction, 
And so we try to sidestep it. And Brad Wilcox is, you know, the sacrificial lamb uh, for the fact that people are start now starting to notice this is not a good explanation. This is not the way we should be defending the church. This is not the way we should be defending uh, what is probably the most profound error in church history. Uh, and, and we need to be willing to confront that head on. So, so, I mean, when you start talking about, okay, well, John DeLynn's having a field day and everybody's making TikTok videos and all of that and all the anti-Mormons, I don't care particularly what they have to say. We know that they're not going to be happy with anything that we say and anything that we do. That's not the point. The people I care about are the people Brad Wilcox was there to try to rescue. The fact that we have a rising generation that is struggling with very difficult questions and are looking for answers and they're not getting them adequately and they didn't get them from this fireside. I don't think that's necessarily Brad Wilcox's fault. I think that we are not addressing these. When Brad Wilcox says, you know, you're asking the wrong question, I get very frustrated because uh, people, if I'm sitting in an audience where they're telling me I'm asking the wrong question, the message I get is, well, then I can't ask you this question because it's not the wrong question for me. I have this question. I'm concerned about racism in the church. I'm concerned about the history of the priesthood ban. And I want to know the answer to it. And you're not willing to give it to me. And you're not, you're trying to sort of sidestep it and downplay it. Uh, I, I, I just, I keep coming back to the idea. I, I, I want to push back on that real quick, Jim. I, sure. I think people are blowing this out of proportion in a way that, um, and then I'll get Quaku because Quaku was raising his hand. How cool was that? Oh, yeah. I actually saw hey, Quaku no, raise his hand. You want to jump in? Before no, I... no, no, Brad, we got to get you and then we'll get Quaku. Say what you got to okay. say, brother. I, I just got to say, like, this is one part of his talk about the whole gospel. He is yeah. talking about way more than just the priesthood ban. I think, um, to your analogy about how this is not the answer um, to race and the priesthood. I don't think it was intended as the answer to everything about race and the priesthood. I think it was a small portion of the rest of his talk. Uh, he even said he didn't want to oversimplify things, right? And then yeah, but ended the rest up. Of his talk had serious problems too. Is the thing? The no, rest it of didn't. Talk... It's not, not the rest of his talk. There were okay. like four problematic things <laughs> in the forty-five things he said, right? So, and I'm not saying that like there was nothing else wrong in the rest of his talk. But there were only a few things wrong, and we amplify those and forget everything else good that he said, right? And recognize he's giving a general summary to a large group of people, right? We we have these things get blown up in front of audiences that they weren't meant for with people saying, well, I had this question. Why isn't he addressing that? Because he was speaking to a group of people who were there to hear a general overview, right? So I, I agree with you. I don't think that the the things that he said about race and the priesthood there were sufficient to answer that full question but that also wasn't the subject of his talk i, I think it wasn't he made just that they were insufficient it was that they were wrong they were incorrect I, but it I wasn't mean, I, I, ben jim, jim i i don't think it was incorrect i i think like quaku said earlier he he said his point in an inarticulate way that made it sound wrong right like his real point was we should be t thinking about why did it take so long for the priesthood to come back in the first place? That does not go against anything else in the church's teachings, right? It isn't wrong. It's a point that you didn't like and a point that you didn't agree with, but it's not wrong. It's something that I think maybe doesn't get to the core of the issue the way you want an answer to the race and the priesthood issue, but it's also not wrong. So I think calling it wrong is... Um, Kind of missing the point in your own side, right? Well, hit like, it, Quaku. I see you. I see you all to jump out of your seat, so, brother. There, uh, okay, Come after so, me, sir. There's a lot, and um, uh, <laughs> well, for, I think the first one is this. Um, I I I disagree, and I look. I know I'm going to get destroyed by the BYU Black Student Union. I know Melody Jackson will make fun of me and all that. Okay, but it's happened since I was a freshman, and they've hated me anyway, so I don't really care. But um, I will say, I think that we have covered this subject over and over and over again. There's a Broadway musical where they're jumping around on stage and the play, the musical takes place in Africa. And the whole 
there's an entire Broadway musical where the second act, the punchline is about the priesthood ban. It's not as if we don't talk about this. We did the B1 celebration, which I was in one of the committees for. We've literally done so much like over and over and over again, blacks in the priesthood, blacks in the priesthood, blacks in the priesthood, okay? I mean, I there, there's a million Salt Lake Tribune articles written on it. The dialogue of Mormon junk, okay, <laughs> I'm kidding, sorry, dialogue of Mormon thought, okay, have written so much on it over and over and over again. So I'm seeing people say, we have not confronted this. We have, we have confronted it. But the reality is there are really three answers. And the three answers are not answers that, that people are willing to accept. The first answer is the apostles were wrong and they didn't listen to God and their, their weak humanity showed. And that's an answer that a lot of people don't like. There's a the second option is, the priesthood ban, there was probably some sort of human error, but used for God's purpose. You meant it for evil, but I meant it for good, what God says in the Old Testament. Um, or, and the third answer is the most controversial answer, and it's, ma- it's like, yeah, maybe he literally wanted a priesthood ban. And you know what? It's one of those three, three answers that nobody likes. So we're trying to come up with this vague you know, uh, well, the people were, were prejudiced and, and okay, well, what does that mean? D- d- does that mean that, like, where, where, where does the extent of that logic go? Brigham Young was, was a, a, a bad prophet? Was he a false prophet? Like, what does that mean? Because everyone is fine with, with throwing Brigham Young under the bus. Let's be honest, okay? Everyone's done it. Over, we blame Brigham Young. I'm not saying the guy was perfect. He did some weird stuff. I'm not, not me. Not, <laughs> when I get to heaven, he's not the first guy I'm going to go meet. You know what I'm saying? I've got some people i'm gonna meet before i meet brigham young jonathan but, browning no. <laughs> yeah, John Lewis Browning. but so I, I i think that the answers we don't want to talk about the actual answers we just want to talk about how it hurt people's feelings but we can't talk about that forever what if we actually get into the explanations of okay let's assume for a minute here and i know this is gonna be very controversial i'm gonna get canceled let's assume for a minute here god actually wanted to withhold the priesthood from people of African descent. Like, let's say he did, okay? Let's let's just straight up say he did. He flooded the world and killed most people, all right? Let's say he, that that is, is small in comparison to what he's actually done from Genesis to now, all right? So let's say he did. Would, would people be okay with that, right? Like, would people say, no, too much, I'm, I'm leaving? Like, let's assume the most radical, like uncomfortable thing is the thing that's true then where does that leave you as a Latter-day Saint? That's the question I want to explore. <laughs> you know what I'm That's saying? It's a good question <laughs> to explore. It's a, it's a question that you have to confront head on because right. when you say that the church has confronted that, the church isn't confronting that. We sidestep it. We dance around it. We try to justify it. We try I, to ignore Jim, it. We try to well, I, 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 I want to say, I want to say though, wait, you, wait, you wait, say wait, that wait. the church doesn't confront it, but well, you, I think it's just that the church hasn't confronted it the way you want it to. no. That's the way I, I, I feel about this sometimes. Because like, like you said, said it's been addressed given, a lot. Okay, uh, of the three uh, three possibilities that Quaker gives us, uh, which one has the church said is the answer? Well, I pause for a minute. So I, I, I think we have to determine what do we mean by the church? Because when I'm thinking... I mean the church. Think, because well, the church published think- in 2013 an essay called Race and the Priesthood where they specifically disavow the idea of the curse of Cain. They specifically disavow the idea that blacks were, were less valiant in the pre-existence. They specifically disavow racism in church leaders. They specifically reference Brigham Young's bigotry. I mean, th- th- there are specific things that the church is willing to say. Yeah, the one thing the church, the church has not been willing to say institutionally, was this a mistake? Was this of God? Uh, and we're not willing to be able to confront that. Well, here's the thing. When, not you the, of that. when you say the church, what you're saying is the brethren. I, I'm saying the church. The church is the entire body. And yeah. I feel like the whole body of the church has, has, has talked about this over and over and over again. And if We've we're talked about to, it, but we haven't confronted, we haven't answered your question. We haven't. I think Jim's exactly right, it. because the reason people keep talking about it and digging it up and up again is because that one question lingers in the mind, which is the central question. And that is, was the priesthood ban ordained of God or not? 
Well, and in that the race, is a the huge question in the mind essay, of, they... of, of the minds of young kids, because it basically is the deciding point of whether or not they say, I mean, that's the thing for me and my whole journey. Once that was the major thing that clicked where I said that everything having to do with the God, if this ban was officially God's command, it corrupts the entire process of who is speaking for God. Because you can go out and you can find other cults who have a prophet figure who claims to speak for God. And when their claim to speak for God articulates something that speaks against your soul because you know it is so deeply immoral that it, there's no way it came from God, it impeaches the claimed authority of that leader. So that question, because it has been avoided, and you brought up the B1 celebration, the B1 celebration was a huge problem because Dallin Oaks got up and modeled loyalty to the brethren over knowing what's right in his heart because he said none of the explanations that the brethren were given made sense to him or spoke to his spirit and he decided to show loyalty to them rather than to speak out against the lies that they were talking about why the priesthood ban existed so if the church like one of the reasons that i can relate to brad wilcox is because i got canceled in 2018 i don't know if you guys remember but I published an apology and made it look like oh, it came from the church. That? Yeah, yeah, that was that. Jonathan. And yeah. um, and the ex-Mormon community went after me deeply. And I got to taste of what it mean, what it feels like to have everybody, even people who are your friends, as well as people who are your enemies, absolutely condemn you. And there's other people that have spoken about the psychological input, impact of that, um, but it, it's I could I could really relate to the quivering in Brad's voice when he was giving his second apology. But the thing is, in that apology, like if you look at the responses to me at the time, um, sisters in Zion were one of the most vocal and powerful voices on that. And there's a moment in um, I forget if it's Temu or the other or um, I forget yeah. her name. Uh, yeah, I think it was actually Zandra, uh, where she moves from criticizing me to talking about the brethren. This is in the weeks before the B1 celebration. And she says specifically, I'm going to be looking at what they say in the B1 celebration, because if they get up and they say that the priesthood ban came from God and that everything that my uh, family, everything that my father had done to me is basically now, or that they w that they endured was put at the foot of God rather than the sins of men, then I can't be in this church because it is that central of a question. It is the fulcrum upon which the legitimacy of the church raises because this is such a core moral principle. And so Quaku's three different options are really important. And the thing is, the church could go out and say it was complete. It was a racist ban. It was a racist ban. And it was totally the result of the sins of men. And they could say that because if you read the text of the fake apology, I had the prophet in his voice taking complete accountability for it being absolutely the sin of men. And that apology made headlines, not because it put the brethren in the worst light, but because it helped people envision what it would be like for the leaders of the church to actually say we were wrong. It's not of God. And it was celebrated in those brief moments before people saw that it was not real. And so that is a glimpse of what the church is missing out on by not having that conversation because it would put all of that stuff to rest. And yeah, they'd have to wrestle with what does this mean about how we conceptualize prophets and leaders in the church? And it would retain a lot more spiritual autonomy on the part of the members because they would feel much more empowered to listen to their own inner voice on the things that the church leaders say because that inner voice is telling them that this whole thing is wrong to attribute it to God in the first place this whole time. I just I I know this is really ironic um, because you know I'm the I'm the black one here and but I I've yeah. thought about this for so like a crazy amount of thought I've read a bunch about it I've jumped ar around let's say let's say the answer was God literally just said I don't want black people to have the priesthood until 1978 but let let's say that was literally got like the second coming. We get to see Christ. He goes, yeah, nope, that was me. Yeah, that's that's literally what I wanted. Okay, let's say that's the answer. If you're down H Oaks and you're up there, okay, and let's say you know that's the answer, 
there, there's no way, there's no way you're going to publicly say that over a microphone. It, there's no way. So I do think there is. Why not? There are so many secrets. There, how many times in scriptures does it reference? And there are many more things that the Lord told us or the spirit conveyed to us that we will not write down. I mean, we can't pretend like, like there is certain information that is true, but is a bit too dangerous for man. That that's a scriptural precedent. I mean, we're, we're talking about the same God that <laughs> killed the sons <laughs> of the Egyptians because, because their leader was bad. He flooded the world. We're, we're, I mean, he's, as he's coming down in third Nephi, he's just wiping out cities just left and right. Drown this one, set this one on fire. Thousands, thousands wiping them out. Like, See the difference, Quaku, is you're using those outrageous. You're using those outrageous examples from Scripture where things that would be seemingly immoral are done in the name of God, and you're using that to then justify future immorality, i.e., the idea that a a racist ban on the but temple and priesthood it, is done. What, I, what I'm saying gone. is, when I look at those stories, I see those those outrageous moral atrocities in scripture as proof that there's either a fictional or a metaphorical element to the part of the scripture and that it's not literal. For me, it also speaks to the Book of Mormon being a piece of 19th century fiction that Christ murdered, you know, millions of people in a bunch of different cities right after he forgave the people who killed the son of God. But like you, it's like, what are you using those scriptural stories for? You're using them to justify to that additional immorality. No, I'm saying that God, if we're talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's already a precedent of things that seem harsh that he does. And if he if he is the redeemer and he's the one who's actually raising us from the dead, he gets to make those decisions. I, so when you say, oh, the, the God, the God of Christianity wouldn't do that, I don't think that's consistent with what Christianity has given us. I think what just Quake because is, it's harsh doesn't mean it isn't of the well, same God. By who that logic, a prophet could say, you know, I'm going to kill my son and oh, well, there's a scriptural precedent. So we've, we've got yeah, to allow well, let me, it. Like, let me jump in on my own podcast. That logic to justify future immorality. <laughs> well, I'm not saying anything goes, but clearly we can't change the nature and character of Yahweh because it makes us uncomfortable. Okay. I, I think, mean, if that's the case, then we may as well just become the United States. So I, I think, let me, let me jump in here. Let, let me yeah. jump in here on my own podcast. Yeah. Um, what I think Quaku is trying to say here is he's not obviously trying to justify uh, the most heinous acts of the Old Testament as, you know, potential exactly commonplace in the 21st century, right? No, I, I that's think, exactly what he's doing, isn't it? No, no I think what he's trying yeah. to say is he's trying to say as an excuse for us to move on as a society and practice the New Testament forgiveness of seven times 70 we should rac recognize that crazier things have happened. I, I think that's kind of what he's saying, is that the recognition of the nutty stuff that's been justified in Scripture should help us overcome modern-day nutty stuff so we all can move on and get along. I think that's where he's going with this, I, I, okay? Well, I mean, I'm happy but, to forgive. I, I, I don't feel like I need to forgive Brad Wilcox because he hasn't done anything to me that requires my forgiveness. Uh, it, it, I mean, I, I think we forgive Brad Wilcox and we give grace to Brad Wilcox and say, you know, this is not about Brad Wilcox anymore. Uh, this is now about the fact that we have a rising generation that is asking a question about the priesthood ban that we, we are not willing to answer. Dallin Oaks is not willing to give that answer because he's afraid of what they're going to do. We, we're pretending like we have a choice as to whether or not I, Jim, we're going to meet I, people where I, they I are. I just don't I just don't think you can know that. You don't know oh, Dallin what? H. Oaks's heart. You don't know I he's don't. afraid of well, other people. So like saying stuff like so that, that, I that's think is why I asked Quake, but why so, won't Dallin Oaks say that? Yeah, but we can't know. And 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 I think for us to try to say that we can and, and say, oh, he must be afraid of what other people will do, that's a useless thing for us to be discussing. Okay. I agree I, with that. So like, let's. I don't care what Dallin Oaks thinks. I want to know: was the priesthood ban of God, or was the priesthood ban the result of the sins of men? I want hey, to know an answer no, to that question. Fine. See, this, I don't care if it's Dallin Oaks that answer? answers that question. And, and who have you asked? I've asked the Lord. What I mean, answer did you a, get? I have an answer to that question for myself. Yeah, what was it? Institutionally, the, the church has not answered that question, and that's the problem. 
That's the problem that, that Brad Wilcox highlighted. He's the sacrificial lamb highlighting a problem that the church has this huge question that is a huge issue for people in and out of the church and people who want to stay in the church and believe in the church and have faith in the church. Uh, but they want the church to be honest okay. with them and be straightforward with them and to answer this question. So, Jim, I think I'm going to bridge a gap here. I have spoken at length with you, even preceding this podcast, about how a robust and full-throated written apology that's on record from the church that the priesthood ban was the mistake of men, whether it was Sidney Rigdon coming back with the Curse of Cain doctrine from the Southern States Mission, or whether it was uh, presentist arguments about uh, Brigham Young's view, view on race, I feel that a full-throated apology on, on behalf of the church officially in written form would be a great step forward because it would demonstrate by example the repentance process that we teach in primary, all right? So you and I have talked about how that would be a nice thing. And I think everybody in this podcast right here would think that's a nice thing. But you want to know what? I kind of feel like this is why we can't have nice things because of what's happening to Brad Wilcox. That, that this, the way we're behaving as a society, not letting a man who we asked to go out and give talks, because, you know, he's kind of more funny than others, and then sit there scrutinizing. It's like when we send young men to Iraq and Afghanistan, and we give them six weeks of training, and they hand them an M16 and say, go fight for your country, and the second they do, we nitpick how they acted and who they shot at, and then we threaten to court-martial them if we don't agree with what they did. These rules of engagement are absolutely psychotic, and guess what? They make sense compared to the rules of engagement that our society is behaving underneath right now, and I agree with Jonathan. This has gone absolutely psycho, the dog pile that's going on Brad, Wilpo on, on Brad Wilcox, and sure, I think it would be good if the church did a full-throated apology. But man, as much as I can't stand these boomers in the church office building, and gosh, I really think a new pre-internet generation needs to take over church leadership, I can see why a current church leader sitting in that church office building would say, oh, hot damn, we ain't touching that subject with a 20-foot pole. Because the one they, guy that they did say a- hot dang, hot dang. Oh yeah, hot dang. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not touching this with a 30-foot pole. Because look what happens. You can't be a well-intentioned man trying to make a dad joke about a controversial topic that maybe some Gen Z or kids in the audience in Alpine, Utah, that don't even know there's a world south of Hurricane, you know what I'm saying? And don't understand the geopolitical, national, and international implications of a priesthood ban that happened when their parents weren't born yet. You can't make a dad joke to that audience without being lambasted. And then when you do get lambasted, if you have the guts, and I say he had the guts to publicly apologize, he keeps getting lambasted and keeps getting lambasted. Then Peggy Fletcher Stack comes out today lambasting him again. You know what I'm saying? Uh, with 15 articles about how racist the Mormon church is. And it's like a guy can't make a dad joke that's inartful, yes. Bad joke, fine, but I'm a comedian. Do you know how many times I've tanked and never been kicked out of a studio? He got worse. He got kicked out and then kept getting kicked out. And then the media ganged up on him. And then all the ex-Mormons ganged up on him. And all the virtue signaling Mormons ganged up on Like, we can't have nice things because an apologetic church leader isn't good enough for these people. And Jonathan said it really well. In a phone conversation we had a couple days ago, you said, like, they can't even take their Ws. They literally got... <laughs> An apology within 24 hours from a church leader. The accountability all these wokesters have been begging for for 20 years was lived out in real time and not good enough. John DeLynn, on his fourth podcast on the subject yesterday, racking in another 10 grand on the subject. What incentive does the church have to apologize and give us these nice things after seeing what happened to Brad Wilcox by the ex-Mormon community? I don't want the church to apologize if the church knows that the priesthood ban was of God and wants... No, they and, don't. And they've, they've many a times come out and said, it was not of God. We disavow the curse of Cain doctrine. It's unclear the origins that it came from. We don't know who to throw under the bus, Sidney Rigdon, Brigham Young, or whoever else. We can't peg it, the, the tail on just one donkey, but we disavow the donkey. <laughs> well, I, I think your point... Your point 
I think that you're speaking to, it, this is not unique to Brad Wilcox. The idea that somebody says something that is against the current um, zeitgeist, that has a moral dimension to it, a, an apology is demanded, and they try to give an apology, and they mess up their apology, and they have to give another. There's this great video, I forget what it's from, it's this guy who has to, he says something, he messes up, and so he gives an apology, and in the course of his apology, he insults a different group and so <laughs> then they show him how giving a third apology uh -huh. and in the course of that apology he has to give a different room and there's like there's no apology that's perfect enough and that's because we've entered this realm where words and language are equ are equated to violence yep. and there is a uh mentality that uh is very eager to jump on and problematize and exacerbate and, and catastrophize any subjective interpretation. So you're going to automatically interpret something in the worst way possible. You're going to assume ill intent, and then you're going to um, retaliate as though that ill intent was there from the person. So we've, we've disconnected someone's intention from the words that they say. And, and so you, you just need to step back and say, wait a second, I need to listen to this like I'm listening to a friend, extend that type of grace and charity to them, try to do as good at, you know, even if they say something that it's, you can't get around how bad it is, then at least you can treat them friendly in your dialogue with them, in your response with them. But well, that's, to your point that's about actually his what I want apology, to ask. his apology wasn't good enough. His second apology, I guarantee you, was not good enough. And any apology that he would subsequently make will not be good enough. And at some point, the returns on apologizing, there's just no returns on it. And the thing that I, you know, a general authority, because he is a general authority, he's in the general presidency, spoke, people called him out on it, and he apologized. Like, that is pioneer work right there. You know, because to have a general authority apologize, that's the thing, that is like groundbreaking, because the church, that is a degree of humility and accountability we've never seen from a general authority leader. And so that is something that, yeah, it probably wasn't the best apology. He, he tried to, you know, smooth things over or whatever, whatever. He, he apologized. And you know the guy is, the problem is we've expanded and exploded the definition of racism. And now we say it's only about systems, but we're certainly willing to demonize a guy individually for, you know, being part of the system or whatever. And it's just, it's an impossible, it's a world I don't want to live in where that is how like you you can't live with people if your words are always going to be taken at their worst interpretation and you're going to get immediate mass reprisals from it and well and this so is what i wanted to ask my like, response was what what how do we that. how do we convert this into action because i got to tell you i just realized something looking at this screen every single one of us have had massive blowback and cancellation from the toxic woke ex mormon community I mean, Jonathan, I forgot you're the guy that did that fake apology. And by the way, what's funny is I never completely read it. I think I read a couple snippets. When I first heard about that, I actually thought that was hilarious. And because you had purchased like Mormon.newsroom and just, I don't remember the content of what you said, but I just thought, dude, a guy trolling the church by purchasing a URL that's only one period away from Mormon.newsroom and then making a fake press release. Okay, that takes guts and that's funny. Okay. Now, sure, you might have said something inartful. You know, you might have said, No, you need to read it. I'll read it. I I'm serious. Okay. I, I will. I'll, I'll read, read it. it. Okay. I'll read it. But at the end of the day, knowing you as I know you, though we disagree about a lot of things in church history and so on and so forth, I doubt you wanted to harm somebody. And knowing that that was not your motive, I want to find the best way possible to give you as much grace as possible when judging that situation. Okay? A, because I'm a human freaking being. And B, because I've spent 38 years of my life going to church, understanding that we are all sinners, we all screw up, we will all be begging for forgiveness when we present ourselves before God. So we might as well practice on each other while we're here on earth. Okay? Kwaku has an entire eight-page section in CESletter.org dedicated to him, right next to Jim Bennett's, who has done more to try and bridge the gap with these people 
<laughs> these people, my buddy always would say, these people. You know, but I can't think of a guy besides Jim Bennett who's done more to try and create peace between the ex-Mormon and the Mormon community, sitting down with Jeremy Runnels to have burgers talking over the CES letter, sitting through five grueling hours of Mormon stories with John DeLynn, sitting no, for three... It was, three, it was yeah. 14. Oh, yeah. 14 <laughs> hours. No, was Hillary Clinton was not on the stand for her email scandal. Longer than he was on the stand for his faith with John DeLynn. And you know what? Then he goes on with Bill Real for four hours. And what did each no, one of these I people do? I was Bill Real first. Oh, fine. For Whatever it was. Hours. They oh, all... 15 hour dude. They all <laughs> weaponized your goodwill and your empathy to try and bridge the gap. And what does Bill Real come out and say? Oh, we won our debate, which wasn't a debate. We won our debate with, with Jim Bennett. Now you get lambasted and there's 10 pages dedicated to you, basically calling you a liar and a charlatan on csletter.org. And forget Kwaku. They utterly hate Kwaku and have made podcasts saying that his membership in the church, church is nothing but internalized racism and that he speaks white enough. He doesn't speak like a, like, um, many black people do okay to be a poster boy for the church john delin and madeline liebrick's words not mine okay so like how, what do we do i want to lead by example like i want to lead by example john delin still can call me and we can hash out these details and hug it out later but he won't i'm willing to but he won't he won't debate us he won't call us he blocks us I think what you do is you do exactly what Quaku did. Like his message was, it, you know, no, no, acknowledge I get that, that in cyberspace Wilcox wasn't perfect and it forgave him and, and it called back to the Christian principle of forgiveness and not oh, just yeah, meager forgiveness, yeah, but abundant I know, forgiveness. I know, but there, there's a point where it just gets so psycho and toxic that, you know, in the, at the end of the Book of Mormon, all the Gaddy Ant robbers, in the middle of the Book of Mormon, the Gaddy Ant robbers all lived in the hills and all the righteous people lived in Zarahemla. But by the end of the Book of Mormon, all the righteous people had to flee and run to the hills because the Gadiant robbers had infested Zarahemla, were killing them, and were murdering them. And I don't know if we're in the diplomatic stage still, or if we're at a point where it's just like disengagement. I want to. Hope breeds eternal. I'm friends with you. I'm friends with Chris Hanna. I'm friends with a ton of ex-Mormons that at least agree in this eternal overarching principle of grace and that the Overton window doesn't need to have pitchforks. But it seems like that's getting a smaller and smaller and smaller chunk of this blogger knackle society and that the group at large, especially on the ex-Mormon side and the woke side, feels more and more and more justified in increasingly harsh, difficult, and cruel measures to justify their opinion that I think we're getting to a point where it's just going to be like, you got to disengage. These people are dangerous. They will try and ruin your family, ruin your job, and attack you on social media as they have endlessly done to every single person on this podcast right now. I don't feel like they've done that to me. I mean, and the, well, and, you I mean, also stopped have. reading yours on the third page, which was probably very healthy. But I did. I did because <laughs> I don't give a, I mean, I, I, I wrote a big long thing to Jeremy Runnels and we, we exchanged very kind emails behind the scenes. But I started going line by line through his debunking of my debunking. And the way I described it to him, as I said, it felt like I was reading the fine print on a mortgage loan. It became so reductive and so minutia focused. I wrote a, a rather larger sort of overarching response to him, which he says he's posted on his site. I haven't checked to see if he has. Uh, but uh, I, I said, you want to get down into the minutia of it, go for it. You can have the last word. Because this isn't about engaging with them. This isn't about fighting with John DeLynn. Well, we have to I, engage I mean, every I really day as a society. My time with John DeLynn. Uh, I mean, I didn't feel like I was being grueled on the stand. And I, I, I like John DeLynn. I consider him a friend. Oh, wait, wait, wait until you see what he says about you behind his back. That's the true measure well, of that, friend. Well, whatever. <laughs> but the point, the point is, the point is, that's not where the fight is. That's not where the battle is. The battle. Pardon, is, you can't, you can't rant for five minutes about people needing to extend forgiveness and grace, and then just I, demonize John Delin. No, right no. Off the I, back. I, like, I said, I said, I'm working on it as an flawed individual. Well, okay. <laughs> we'll come and hug <laughs> it out in the studio, and he can say his piece. Long term, oh, no, the, no, the that's goal. different because we're talking about people, and John Delin's not a person. Oh, it's I, a, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I do want to say, I, I see where you're coming from, Jim. Um, that that's not the fight that we're dealing with. We're dealing with helping people find the truth, right, and right. find it for themselves. 
And I, I think that we need to not lose sight of that. And, well, and, and I think we, I mean, I, I think we lose sight of that when we make this about Brad Wilcox, because I mean, I, I, I think Brad Wilcox deserves all the love and kindness that we can give him and all the grace that we can give him at this point, you know, he, he has apologized, which is, you know, it's a huge, huge, I mean, Jonathan's absolutely right that it's unprecedented and it, it's a beautiful step forward. It's not the apology I would have liked him to have given, but the fact that it's there is a huge step forward. We should celebrate that and not worry about the minutia of what's in there. Uh, the larger issue for me, the, wh why I think this has blown up is not because uh, Brad Wilcox is a bad guy or we're trying to beat up on Brad Wilcox. or uh, It's not about people. It's about the principle. It's Brad Wilcox was doing his best to, to uh, maintain an unsustainable argument which is we cannot deal with the issues that he was talking about by sidestepping them anymore. We've sidestepped them for way too long. We spent a lot of time. We have to confront them head on. And that, I mean, that's where, that's where I am. I am not angry at Brad Wilcox. I, I you know, I, I feel, you know, if, if Brad Wilcox has taken offense at the comment I posted on his Facebook post, I'm happy to apologize to him because to me, it doesn't have anything to do with Brad Wilcox at this point. It has to do with, how do we confront this huge issue? And, and people are leaving all over the place. Jonathan has left over this issue. He said to some degree that this was one of the, the issues that, that drove him out of the church. Uh, there are people who are leaving over this and we have not figured out the, the way to confront it. We have not figured out the way. And, and if the confronting it requires, guess what? God demanded it. God killed people in a flood. And you know this is the way it works. Uh, then that needs to be our answer. We need to stand by it. I don't think that's the answer, uh, but um, we, we need to provide the answer. We need to stop. So here's the, I, if, if they want to have a conversation, I will not have the conversation under the rules of the people that are psychos who just hate us and just don't want Mormonism to exist. Because those people, when they are driving the conversation through their media narrative, it's a form of manipulation. I will not play that. I said, do we have to disengage? If I, every day I get followed by some loser's new anti-Mormon Instagram account with 15 followers because he's trying to cash in on now the new, you know, the new uh, media empire of anti-Mormon stuff. And I just block them. I don't engage with these people because I've seen how it's nothing but suburban toxicity in the religious world. There's nothing good that's coming of it. So I will not do any of this i will not have i will not play the game or have a conversation or a dialogue under the auspices of these people because they don't want the dialogue they just do not want us to exist as mormons and and once you understand that 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 is the complete objective of bill real that is the that's half the objective of john delin he kind of needs mormons but but that is what the, they just don't want mormons to exist it's really simple it's not some convoluted, crazy system. They hate the Book of Mormon. They don't like what happens to the temples. They don't like the church leaders, and they don't like our ancestors. That's just what it is. So no, I'm not going to play the game and pretend as if, oh, I need to have this dialogue about whatever, whatever. No, I've been black my whole life, all right? I've, I've given it far more thought than most of people having this conversation, all right? It doesn't matter. Like, like I'm sorry, I will have the conversation with faithful people that believe in the doctrine of the restored gospel, but I'm finding that most of these people commenting on it don't have faith in the restored gospel. And then, if, and, and if that's the case, what's the point of the conversation? If you don't believe that we have, like, God is our literal father and Jesus rose from the dead and that Nephi actually came here from Israel to the Americas, why do I care about your opinion on these other Mormon things? I want to know what the Mormons think. That would be like me coming up and saying, you know, here's my opinion. Have a dialogue with me on Pope Innocent VI. Oh, when were you Catholic? I've never been Catholic. Well, I don't really care what you think. To, to me, to be honest, I, I, I mean, sure, you talk about it, but your opinion on this doesn't have some, isn't moving mountains. If you don't believe in the doctrines of this faith, then why should we alter our faith to fit your paradigm? I'm sick of pretending it's the same thing. It's not the same camp. And, you know, I don't I just... I, I think we're being manipulated. I think these people are manipulating Mormon niceness to use it against us. And I think the 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 so many Mormons have totally been manipulated into jumping into this boat 
and giving money to thrive in these organizations they shouldn't be giving money to and having these conversations made on 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 a false guidance these people don't actually care john De- how long has it been since john delens had a black person interviewed on his own youtube channel how long has it been it's been pretty damn long dude all of black history month it. not one I don't do understand it for a reason. Quaku, Quaku, you're you're playing into the exact mentality that you don't like. You're playing into you. identity politics. You're trying to use the identity politics wedge to try to paint John DeLynn as a racist. No, I think he's just getting no, no, tired of hypocrisy. I'm not he's a I think he's it's like Dave Chappelle saying, I will not be summoned. I will have a conversation, but I will not be summoned. I, Why does to, this have anything to do with John DeLynn at all? Why are I we talking the same about thing. John one way or the other? <laughs> I think he's just making an example well, because all his platform it. is the one that blew this up. And I no, think, and then the guy who blew this up was some anonymous dude on Twitter who just posted it and it got shared by a whole bunch of people. John, I, I saw it through John DeLynn. It, John, John DeLynn's the one that fine. got it far. The, the point is, the point is, I, Kwaku, I'm behind you a hundred percent when you say you're not going to engage those, these people. I really am. I mean, the, the kinds of trolls that come after you, block them right away. That's not who we're engaging. That's not who Brad Wilcox was trying to engage. No, but the I'm problem saying here the is the people in general under the auspices of of the well, ex Mormon or woke Mormon. Yeah, but not, this is not about how do we find a better way to dialogue with the ex Mormon community. This is about how do we answer the questions of the millennials who are leaving the church, who want to stay in the church but aren't getting the kinds of answers that they're looking for. That's that's the issue. That's where we should all be united. I mean, sh- sure, you can vilify John DeLynn and Bill Reel and anybody else. They, they don't have anything to do with this. Uh, See, I'm with you. I'm now. with all of you in one way. It's <laughs> I think it's symbolic that I'm in the middle of this little Zoom chat. Because, like, I, I'm right there with you, Jim. I'm like, this isn't about any individual podcaster. It's about the big problem as a whole. But I'm with Quaku because I'm like, the solution Jim's looking for can't be given under the current system because the current system is just wildly toxic. And the people that are demanding it, they're the people that oh, hate but- the church and will never be satisfied. And then I understand Jonathan Streeter saying, ah, you know what I'm saying? Like, this can't be the, the system. We have to move the Overton window. Like, the and, people are demanding it are my children. Uh, yeah, okay. And I have nephews that are no longer in the church and racism and LGBT issues are the reasons they're leaving because that's their moral center. And they see and the church they not see connecting it as the microcosm Jonathan, that represents would, the macrocosm. I, 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 wanna, I get that. I want to know a thing uh, for both of you guys. Would the church issuing an apology do anything to save their faith? Yes. In my family, yes. And Jonathan, the entire church. Yeah, because if the church issued an apology, that is the crack in the dam that breaks forth a whole bunch of different paradigm changing things in the church. Because what it then does is it forces everybody to reconceptualize the nature of a prophet, and it allows people to understand that the church is no different from other religions in terms of its claim to speak for God and that the church leaders then have to take what is a religiously humble approach to any other policies that they institute. And it just, I think it just, it calls for then the church leaders to be completely introspective about Mm -hmm. what it is that they do. And, And the claim to act as God's mouthpiece goes away because they can't, claim that unless they're speaking of things that are so pure and unimpeachable around the concepts of love and forgiveness that that there's no you know question but that it is a divine principle jonathan that's the first thing you've said tonight that i disagree with well tell me about it well because because I, i i and i said this to Cardin in our previous podcast but i firmly believe that the false doctrine of prophetic infallibility is at the heart of just about every problem the church is facing today. The idea that we expect these leaders to be perfect and that they can't be God's representatives if we can demonstrate that they have not been perfect. Uh, that somehow, that, that, that it's such an all or nothing sort of proposition that we can't, 
we cannot reconcile an image of Brigham Young as a racist and a product of his time, and also a man of God who was called by God to do a great work. I believe in a Brigham Young who was both of those things. And the reality is that every prophet of God uh, in the church prior to the establishment of the restored church, every prophet in the Bible, every prophet in the Book of Mormon, uh, every single one of them uh, was that kind of flawed human individual that God was able to use to do a great work. And, and we, you know, you are absolutely right when you say it, it, you have to start redefining what a prophet is. And it, because so many of us have defined prophets to be these flawless, perfect, infallible men. Uh, and it's false. It's absolutely false. It's demonstrably false. And they've told us. Yeah. So, so I just want to jump in there really fast. So first off, Quaco had a hard out at 10. So I just dismissed oh, him. Um, we can finish this up ourselves here, though, um, yeah. because I think we all know where he stands. He has no, <laughs> yeah, no, no qualms. Um, uh, what, what's it called? Punching his stake in the ground. Mm -hmm. Um the only thing I push back on that, though, is that you say that, like, the church is taught that prophets are infallible. You know, I never got that growing up. Like, I, I just me sometimes. Neither. Yeah. Brad says me neither. Like, I, I'm glad I, to hear that because I never was taught, dude, the prophet's infallible. No, I was taught the prophet's more infallible than most. He's called of God. There's reasons he was called of God. So you should listen to him. However. It's Moroni's promise that you should ask God yourself, not ask Russell M. Nelson to get his opinion. So I feel like if you practice true faith and the true doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and not just what was ever popular in the Wasatch Front or your Mormon-dominated suburb, okay, that this won't have been a problem. Okay, so and there's okay. You guys are misrepresenting. There's a little bit of a straw man argument here. That the idea is not that the prophet is perfect in all of his dealings. It's that when the prophet says something that has an intersection in your life with some position or decision that you may have a difference on internally, the, it's incumbent upon you to subordinate your perspective and allow the prophets to take its place. And the the way I say that is replicated. Is we have. President Nelson now. But that's when totally he was the unscriptural, of, Jonathan. No, oh, 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 no. Hold on a second. Okay. Hold on a second. He said, you know, prophets teach the truth. And so the truth is a standard that we all understand is important. So if the what the prophet teaches is the truth and you think something different, then there's a conflict there that the resolution is to trust in the prophet. He's also said that the tr the prophet will teach things that are not politically correct and that you know, it may not be convenient for you to accept what the prophet teaches. And so the idea then is that if there are things that you disagree with the prophet, he's teaching the truth and you need to subordinate your default perspective and allow his to fill that okay. in. There's messages about follow the prophet. There's primary songs about it. These are not saying that the prophets are perfect, but what it's saying is when the prophet teaches something or establishes a policy based on commandment, then if your perspective is different, you need to get in line. And that's repeating. Oh, okay, you know, the hold on. I got to get this issue. out before your first to answer your first question so that I can then answer your second. Um, okay. Yes, you are right. I see how somebody could think that dot, dot, dot. If they weren't raised in a faith with the same primary answers, we we're taught every Sunday to read your scriptures and pray. Because you know what happens when you read your scriptures as a member of the church? You read the book of Acts, where the apostle Peter constantly fought with the apostle Paul. And you realize really quickly, oh, wow, these guys aren't infallible. In fact, they have arguments. Oh, and they get stoned like Stephen in the book of Acts. Can you, oh, can you yeah. pause, pause? And they admit pause to and levity. To, well, no, can hold you on. pause and go back to... Uh... I'm, you guys cut out there. I'm sure my, I was the one that cut okay. out, but I couldn't. All I heard was um, it would make sense if it was some wasn't somebody that grew up 
getting the same lessons in primary or something like okay, that. Okay, yeah. So and I, I said, I didn't hear I said, anything after that. Okay, so what I said was I could see you, you use the word subordinate a lot, saying that the church teaches you to subordinate your thoughts and your internal dialogue to what the prophet says because the prophet is infallible, the prophet's great, and and the term subordination means you put yourself below, right? And I'd say, okay, I could see maybe how somebody could think that's the message of the church. Had they not been raised in the faith that literally says every Sunday, 15 times, read your scriptures, pray daily. Because the second you start reading your scriptures, you read all these stories of Jonah who defied God, didn't go to Nineveh, was punished for it. And you realize, wow, these guys really are fallible. And then you read the book of Acts where the apostle Peter is fighting with the apostle Paul. Oh, and guess what? Not only are they not infallible, but they fight and they argue with each other. And after they're done arguing, sometimes they get stoned like Stephen does. And and Moses killed a guy. And, and, and you read a history replete with prophetic fallibility. And you realize their batting average is better than mine, so I should listen to them. But at the end of the day, every single one of these books, whether it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the Book of Mormon, say pray about it. And how many times did all of us here in church, the number one thing the church teaches you is to what? Recognize the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and then two, to have the courage to act upon those promptings. I never heard in my life that the number one thing that the church teaches is to listen to the brethren. Yes, there's some weirdos that fall in love with these guys as though they're professional baseball players, and they collect handshakes with the prophets and apostles like they're baseball cards. And I don't like those people. But you want to, they're people. So the first and, law of heaven is obedience. And uh, obedience whether it's by my own voice or the voice of my prophets, like there's all these different memes that exist in the gospel if we that don't finish reinforce those phrases. that idea. And, and if Jonathan, we don't finish the, those phrases, the first law of heaven is obedience, yes, to the commandments of God. And nowhere in the Ten yeah. Commandments did it say there was a priesthood ban. In fact, if you translate the original Coin Greek of the ten, ten Commandments, there's a stronger argument against the priesthood ban than there is for it. So yes, I do believe. So the if you one look at God. the people who spoke out against the priesthood ban and the false teachings about it, they were reprimanded and chastised not only by other apostles, but also by church members. So you can look and at the those that of did Stuart it will Udall. be held to account during the times of judgment. Okay. But what I'm saying is that those things create a cultural norm in the church That's that wrong. you don't question or speak against the church. And it, it also creates an internal pressure where you start to feel like there's something wrong with your own moral compass. If you have different feelings from the church, and, if you haven't worked these things out. And like, that's just like, that's what the kids are struggling with. And you I, can deny it and talk around it all you want, but that it really is. I, I don't no, think I'm it's not talking denying. around it to say that it's, it's just incorrect. Just like Jim was saying earlier, like this doctrine of prophetic infallibility, that's not a doctrine. We, this is a cultural thing. Like you just said, So what do you do it's when it's the prophet himself who's saying, even if I tell you something that you disagree with, or is not, you know, with your politics, you still need to do what I say. Well, who, what I, prophet said that? Because I, I know about, Brigham Young said, I fear a, blind obedience President from Nelson. this people. I feel like literally yeah. Brigham and, Young came out and said, I fear blind obedience of this people. <laughs> and, and, and Jonathan, I think it, this all gets muddied by looking at what was said by a prophet at one point in time in one place and then expanding it to everywhere. Just like what we're talking about with Brad Wilcox. We expand the things that, that makes we're... perfect sense in this four window thing that we're doing here. But mm -hmm. the kids aren't going to that argument is going to be like, I, yeah, it, right. OK, it, boomer. Yeah, I, I got to go with Jonathan on this one in that it's disingenuous to suggest that the expectation of prophetic infallibility is not something that is widespread. throughout. And, and I'm not saying that it's not widespread. I am <laughs> saying that it's not doctrinal it's I, widespread right? that, that by the same correct. boneheads that, that think correct. you have to take the sacrament with your right hand and i'm well, sorry handbook now alan oaks has, has endorsed that shut uh, up really I, I, yeah, yeah it's, it's in the handbook. Handbook. I had an audio recording on my channel of oaks visiting the priesthood quorum and of all the different questions of the day he hammers down on you taking it with the right hand Oh, Dallin, what are you the, doing, all brother? Stuff, I, see, I know. See, this stuff, I agree with Jen, Jim's point in terms of, well, I guess the thing I would have to say is that looking at the what's happening in the wake of Wilcox is that there is something that is more dangerous to the church than anything else. And that is that people inside the church who have adopted the um, 
what people are calling critical race theory or um, systemic approach to things within the church, now using it to try to change the church from within the church because it's a very um, power-oriented way of looking at everything that yeah. also has such a moral vector to it that it's hard to dis disagree with without being called a racist yourself. And it, it will dissolve friendships. It will dissolve families. It will dissolve organizations yes. because it is just, you cannot exist in an organization that has that mindset. Um, it'll just, it, I don't know. I think I fear for that more than anything else. Um, you know, there's a few TikToks now with, um, people just going around campus and you're starting to see a lot of the same symbols, a lot of the same slogans that you would find, you know, in Berkeley or whatever the places that, you know, or in the cultural revolution the, of China that you talk about. Uh, well, there's, there's, there's parallels there, but that is going to be more dangerous than anything that ex Mormons can do. Cause you guys really don't care too much about what ex Mormons say or do, but this ideology taking hold within the walls of the church is going to be more damaging to the church. And it'll lead to, to more conflict within the rank within the church or more people leaving just as they see it's not, consistent. Like I'd rather have people leave over historical issues from a liberal perspective than over, you know, the wokeism. Yeah. <laughs> as sad as that is, because <laughs> I'd rather exist among people who still believe in freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And and that's going away. That's considered complicity. Okay. Well we're gonna have to wrap up here pretty soon. Yeah. Um, I, I do I do want to say I think that when, when it comes down to the issue of the prophetic infallibility thing we were discussing, I do think there's room for this to have been the mistake of men, and that doesn't delete the authority of the church, right? I, I think that that works. I, I don't think that it has to be, if you were wrong about the priesthood ban, there's no more authority to the church. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just think that that's an oversimplification of, um, and maybe a misunderstanding of the way that the prophetic office works because I, I think, like Cardin was mentioning earlier, um, the prophets are going to be held accountable for the things that they taught, right? And so it's not as though there's just this nebulous, like, oh, hey, well, it, a prophet was wrong and it just kind of disappears. Do you think the prophets don't worry about what they're saying and why they're saying it and who they're saying it to? Like, I think they spend a lot of time focused on those things and it's because they're going to be held accountable for the way that they teach us the truth. It, it, everything that we read in the Bible about the way that the watchmen are supposed to take care of themselves and how they're supposed to warn the people, I think points to that. And you know, so I it, think I learned, I think I learned something here from, from this experience, Jonathan, is that all of this prophetic infallibility was not part of my growing up and we are our formative years. Okay. It, it just, it, it, that was not part well, of my a, you guys are stuck on saying the word prophetic infallibility and that that's not really the notion that's the straw man i mean it, it's not prophetic infallibility it's it's the hierarchy of where your personal autonomy exists when it contradicts what the prophet says and whether you have the ability in your own heart and mind to override something that the prophet has in you know put out that bears upon you and your world. I, I guess my answer, my answer to that would be that no man in a relationship with his wife, though he has the priesthood is more important than her or in a hierarchy above or below her when they have to agree on something in order to move forward. Because if consensus is a requirement, then there is no hierarchy. So in my mind, if I'm living a pure life, I'm treating my body correctly, I'm treating my spirit correctly, and I'm learning what truth is, there will never be a true prophet that says to do something that I will not be in congruence when I seek my own direction from the Lord. Because when truth is the consensus that is required. I will never have to subordinate myself to a prophet because my personal prayers will be revealing the same truth and that that personal revelation in conjunction with the prophetic declaration will be like two nails in a board that secure it.
So I've never thought I had to bend some knee to Russell M. Nelson. I've always felt lucky that God established a hierarchy where there are men who are not paid anything other than a living stipend, despite the billions that the church has, to prayerfully consider all of the church's affairs and use their best judgments to create declarations in that prayerful hierarchy that I can then go home and verify with God myself. And whenever those two meet up, I know for a fact that that's what I should be doing. There's no subjugation. There's only freedom through personal revelation. That's the Mormonism I've always known. Stuart Udall would probably differ with that just in his personal experience. Who, Who would? He could have probably felt Stuart Udall. He probably would have felt the same way, but he's the guy that petitioned the, you know, wrote a letter anyway to the prophets asking them, you know, is this our policy? And this was, you know, a few years after uh, Lowry Nelson did it. And if he had started out with the same statement you made where prayerfully considering if he was ever questioned the prophet on a matter of great importance, there would be harmony between their perspectives. Stuart Udall was on the perspective of these teachings about the curse of Cain and the restriction on the priesthood are wrong. And the prophet's perspective was, no, they are right. And not only are they right, but they're based on commandments, you know, and it's not just policy. So he came away from that exchange himself chastised by the prophets who were endorsing a false idea. So even if he had started with your perspective where it's never going to be different, if I pray about it and I go to the leaders, we're going to be in harmony. He found that that was not the case. And I think a lot of people are looking at and they're saying, well, that means that the moral authority of the leaders on something so fundamental as the universal brotherhood of man, if they got that wrong, then that leaves the field very wide and open for them to get other things wrong. So when the policy of November 2015 comes down, it's another check mark on that side of the board of they've lost some moral authority because they're placing things in the mouth of God, saying this is a commandment or a directive from God that does not... Harmonize so with people's I, own internal I think, voice. Of Jonathan, what you're, comes you're from God. putting you're putting so much weight into things that were never intended for the audiences that you're putting them towards. I get where now, he's you're, coming you're from, though. About, like, I, I'd love no, 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 I'd love no, to let hear somebody's finish. answer you're, you're on this. You're talking about a personal interaction between somebody with a prophet and the way that they talk about it. You don't think it. There's, you don't, there's no like, there's no but commandment. The, the interaction was about a principle that was being spouted over the pulpits worldwide let me me bridge this gap i think i understand where jonathan and jim are coming from is that you you can't establish this idea that okay prophets are the mouth mouth mouthpiece of god and then find specific examples where they've done something that is just wholesale rejected as immoral and they're not calling to question pretty much everything else they've ever said okay um I, i feel that way myself I, I'm with Jim and with Jonathan saying, okay, like we really need to call into question how much authority we give somebody who says they're acting in the name of God if they're endorsing crazy immoral stuff that all of us agree was immoral. And if they were godly for 125 years, wouldn't have screwed up on. So like I'm with you guys 100%. At the same time, again, I say I've read the scriptures, including the book of Omni where there was like seven kings straight that said, oh yeah, I wasn't a really good king. In fact, I was kind of stupid. So I'm giving the plates to my son, Gomer. And then Gomer's like, oh yeah, uh, I spent most of my time just chasing women and fighting the Lamanites. So I'm giving my son to, uh, you know, like we went through seven prophets before we get to a good guy, Enos, or whoever came next, right? I, I-, I read... Malachi, where for 400 years, there was no prophetic influence on the earth before Jesus Christ came, except for a bunch of false prophets. And I'm not saying they were false prophets, but I get that not all prophets are created equal. In fact, some will really screw up. Some will do some really stupid stuff like Jonah, 
who not only hated Ninevites so much he didn't want to preach there, they even after having been swallowed up by the whale and then finally been subjugated by God's like torments and three days in the belly of the whale, finally went and preached in Nineveh. And then when he baptized a bunch of Ninevites, complained about them and said, I hate having to go to church with Ninevites. So, like, I'm okay with well, understanding... Well, the problem is you're talking about past dispensations and the current prophets have specifically and explicitly and recently said that the current dispensation will not have an apostasy like the one that you're talking about. And it's reinforced the idea that yeah, but apostasy the prophetic is mantle that is passing... But- it, and he's he's not saying that this is an apostasy, though, Jonathan. Yeah. He's saying... Well, he's all saying, those past dispensations he's talking about ended in apostasy. And no, but I'm no, saying no, this no, no, was no. a There's, sin. You can bring There's, up stories like what what of... The things that the prophets have said, are you willing to stand up in church and say, I think the prophet is wrong about this? I mean, there's mandates. a social cost no. <laughs> to doing that. No, so, yeah. Jonathan, Do you think I'm I, not willing to pay the social cost? I've been canceled by Mormons when I, and ex When I said that an apology from the church would transform the church, what I mean is it would change the church to what other churches are, which is other churches, if you let go of the claim of divine sanction and you're the mouthpiece for God— then you have to approach the entire enterprise from a degree of humility that changes how you act as a, an ecclesiastical leader. And it also changes the expectation of the members. So the members can say, there's even less separating me from the people in the church. And I, even if that happens, I agree, the yeah. church still has an institutional authority, even if they have to let go of some of the divine authority. See, well, okay, and, so I think, I don't think you lose the divine authority. And I think Jim can explain this a little bit better than me. Well, because to me, you're just setting it. To me, if the requirement is consensus between personal revelation and prophetic revelation, there is no hierarchy. And we should be grateful for prophets and the role that they do play and the gift that they are. But this isn't a military. These aren't generals. We are all God's children. So you don't lose divinity by accepting humanity. Well, let me tell you a quick personal story, and, and I, I, I realize we're we're coming up on it. Yeah, yeah, I hear. Here. Uh, but uh, five minute so, warning. <laughs> so five minute. So my um, my my mother is the granddaughter of David O. McKay, and my father is the grandson of Heber J. Grant. And I grew up with the expectation that comes with having two great grandfathers who were presidents of the church. And, and both men were spoken of in such reverential tones, still are really, by members of the family, uh, you know, that what that did to me, little Jimmy Bennett, was make me feel like, well, geez, I'm, you know, I'm the great grandson of prophets, and look what an idiot I am. I mean, it, it really kind of destroyed my self-image. Uh, I, so I, I get older, and I uh, serve a mission, and I was assigned to serve in Scotland which is where the McKays came from. And I served up in Thurso, Scotland, which is the northernmost point of the British mainland. And uh, nobody is up there, (laughs) let alone members of the church. We had three people who came to church and we met in a community center and they were going to shut the area down. And then they said, okay, well, let's do something to try to get attention. And I said, well, I'm David O. McKay's great grandson and the house where his, his grandfather joined the church is still standing. Why don't we have some kind of lecture? where I can talk about that. And so as part of that, uh, my family sent me copies of David O. McKay's missionary journal. And I, I may get struck down for this, but I read his missionary journal and I discovered that David O. McKay was a truly lousy missionary who didn't baptize anybody and spent all of his time mooning over his girlfriend that would end up being his wife. And uh, he would take days off from his missionary service to go tour Glasgow whiskey factories and at one point said some woman tore up the tract and she was a haggard looking thing and I'd as leaf die as distribute tracts for another day you know I mean and I read that and it was one of the most uplifting experiences of my life because all of a sudden it was geesh if David O. McKay could go from that to being president of the church there is hope for Jim Bennett And I had spent so much time thinking of these men as demigods uh, that it really destroyed my self-image. And we, I mean, it is, it is folly to say we don't perpetuate that image. 
that we don't continue to perpetuate that image. Just last Sunday, our lesson was how do we align our lives with the brethren? And I thought, I don't need to align my lives with the brethren. Yeah, they're boring, dude. <laughs> Christ. I don't you know, want to. But, but this expectation uh, of, of, of uh, I, I think Jonathan is absolutely right that if we were to admit that a prophet had got something so wrong like this, it would have to redefine what we think a prophet is. It would have and to redefine the cultural definition, not the doctrinal yeah. one. Well, yep. the, but, but, but we have to do that. So we let's do that. And I think we do that here. Do that. I think we do that on our channel. You and I literally did an entire right. podcast on right. how we get prophetic infallibility wrong. And the only thing I want to do with Jonathan right here is bridge this gap. Because I, I really think, Jonathan, that to me, understanding that prophets are not infallible and that you have to have this consensus between personal revelation and prophetic revelation, that we have to live Moroni's promise, redefines not the prophet, but redefines church membership. All of these problems and this prophetic infallibility nonsense came from a very lazy church membership where people started deferring decision making upon yeah. the MPMA, the, the Na Motion Picture Association of America. Oh, if it's rated R, then it has to be bad because these eight people over there said it was bad and I'm righteous if I don't watch it. No, that's garbage. Okay. The MPAA did not sit down and pray about what you're going to, uh, what's good content for you and your family in that situation. You need to be asking God how you should be spending your leisure time. And if what you're about to show your kids is going to be wholesome family entertainment, not the Motion Picture Association of America. A and by taking that responsibility on to magnify our callings as members... We have to do what people don't want to do. Everybody wants to pray for change, but nobody wants to change themselves. And as a people, as a church with a little C, as a large group of people, I think to stop future idiocy like priesthood bans from church leaders who are like, well, if the last prophet said it, it's got to be true. And well, these guys over here are interpreting these verses as curse of Cain. And well, and that makes sense because we believe the Bible to be the word of God as long as it's translated correctly. So I, I guess so. We have to step up as members and say, no, I've prayed about this and this is not right. There are. You're absolutely right. What I mean, I can't agree with you more in terms of letting go of the brethren of the mouth as the mouthpiece of God it is incumbent upon you to be much more serious about your own moral framework, your own personal convictions, your own grounding in the principles that you hold dear to your see, heart. That and, what and you're saying like what is a always lot of what I was taught. have to go through is when you let go of the church, you have to build your moral foundation from the ground up. Problem is that there are other moral structures that are out there ready to jump in. Yeah, and, and as much and, as I'm talking about this stuff, like my big fear, if you if, you know Denver Snuffers group, everybody gets their personal revelation. The problem is it's chaos, and nobody there's no unifying factor. So I understand from an evolutionary or institutional perspective, having a hierarchy of authority who can declare what's official and what's not serves to unify and stabilize the group. Um, and if you're in an a hierarchical um, polity church organization, you kind of have to have that. It's, it's, it's it just requires the, the degree of rethinking of what the church is, is so fundamental once you let go of that divine so, authority. Okay, Brad, so, take us Jonathan. home because you're the nice Canadian that always ends things well, dude. <laughs> Ish. No, not today. Um, so I would say, Jonathan, I there are two... Um, kind of instances with Joseph Smith that really stand out to me when it comes to our relationship to God and the prophet and how those coexist. And they're the story of just, I mean, there, there's a lot of people who would come up and ask Joseph questions and he would ask them, have you inquired of the Lord? And they would say, well, you just, you ask him for me. Right. And I think that is the thing that Cardin's talking about where we defer our own ability to choose what's wrong and right and just 
have the prophet do it for us because we're too lazy and we, we become slothful servants in that instance. And that's what you watch a bunch of cult documentaries and you'll see a lot of these spiritual gurus when they're confronted with questions because people are subordinating their will to the guru. The guru will frequently turn questions back onto the person and then the person will be like, oh, that's so wise. I can find the answer myself. It's just a very it's a deflection and it, it's kind of no, like no, it's, it's not a deflection. That's not what it's, I'm talking about. It's it, the pride cycle. Of, Hold on a second. That's the pride cycle, John. Jonathan, working in real time in front of our eyes. Maybe in North America, especially because of our post-war wealth, we had actually developed some really stupid ideas of men mixed with scripture, as they say in all those really bad videos. But down in Brazil, where people were still struggling with hard times that were creating tough men, that were creating good times, that created soft men, okay? Maybe because they were at a different part of the pride cycle and they were all having personal revelation saying we should join the church and that church all of a sudden got flooded with a bunch of black, half black, quarter black members that wanted to enter the temple, wanted to enter church leadership, wanted to enter uh, you know, the house of Israel, when all of a sudden they were confronted with this and they're praying, they realized, wow, we can't baptize half a guy. We can't make a bishop, one quarter bishop. The priesthood ban was doused, not because of, of, of rich pride cycle, lame uh, Utah Mormons who were four generations removed from the sacrifice of their pioneers so badly that they were standing on the shoulders of giants as they slouched. No, those weren't the guys that got rid of the priesthood ban. The ones that got rid of the priesthood ban were the ones that were freaking living the gospel and getting baptized down in Brazil. So maybe we need to go back to being like the Brazilian members in the 70s and less like the American members in the 70s who were Republicans first or racist first or Dodger fans first and then members of the church second and go back to being members of the church first like the guys in Brazil were. That's all I'm saying. So it's saying. really easy to look back and take the side that's on the right side of history but like, are you doing the same thing in terms of how the church is preventing women from holding the priesthood and acting and participating in the things that priesthood holders do? Because you have to just put yourself in the mindset of the people before the priesthood ban was changed. What was their attitude towards these things? Were they were they sit thinking the same way like Brad does in defending the leaders? Oh, well, the leaders are, you know, they're good. They're doing the right thing. And or were they you know, were you willing to speak out against something that was wrong? Because right now, I think most people in the church have confronted ordained women, what they were calling for, and they're just following the brethren. And some of them, as soon as they get to the point where they cross the threshold, like, no, I think it's so wrong that women are prevented from having that office that it is a deal breaker for me, then they'll leave. But Brad Wilcox's talk hit those people as well because of how he interfaced with the question of women holding the priesthood when he was talking about his daughters and that'll be the church. subject of the next one we could totally tackle that issue on the next one yeah um and um finish this up brad because you're nice and then jim and brad finish this up just, just <laughs> the other thing the other thing that jonathan was saying though um i i totally get where you're coming from with the hierarchical structure being necessary to keep things going the other experience that i think of in church history with that is with hiram page with the seer stone he had and how he started receiving revelations. And Joseph Smith said, no, look, you can't receive revelation for the church as a whole. Right. And, and I think that that's another thing that we need to think about, right? Like we have our personal level of our devotion to God and the way that we relate to others and the church. And then there's the institutional church itself. Right. And really our prophets are going to be held accountable for what they do for the way that they lead the church. You have to be with, careful doing that though, because what that leads to displaced accountability and what, you know, it's called agentic actions where you say, I'm going to do what the prophet says. He's responsible for what he does. I was just following orders. Oh, there's and a, I, I there's totally, a problem with that. No, I, I agree with you. I, I think that that can be taken to an extreme that's unhealthy. Um, and and there's like, no gospel I, that says follow orders. Like I said before, our gospel is not, uh, our church is, the is first not. Law of heaven. That's a follow orders no, principle. I, but obedience to the laws of God, 100%. not the prophet. Like the, that, the church is not an army. And it's obedience to the spirit. Yeah. Like you, you, you want to follow the spirit. And, and I've even been taught over the pulpit. Like if the spirit witnesses something else to you, the other than what I've said, that is what you need to know. Right. Yeah, and you really have to understand the context of obedience being the first law of heaven. Like, I was never taught that 
the the prophet is a general unless like we were literally at times of war with like i don't know the phoenicians or something you know well but i mean if i if i, if I can wrap this up yeah, yeah wrap please. I, I mean we, we could talk about this for hours i'm wandering over here but, it's all good. but uh, i i think the lesson here about brad wilcox we should forgive brad wilcox give him grace but Brad Wilcox, I, I think the reaction to Brad Wilcox is starting a good conversation that I think needs to continue. And I think we've had some of that here tonight, but I, I absolutely want to see more of that uh, here and throughout the church, because the kinds of questions that Jonathan is raising are questions that we need to answer and, uh, and I think require discussion. And I don't think we should ever be afraid of that kind of discussion, because I mm -hmm. think that's what the Lord would have us do. All right, dudes. I love the idea of people on your side having that discussion, but then people on my side need to have a big discussion about how far do you take things in trying to make your point against the church? And are you going to really hurt people in the wake of that? And if you turn into a monster in trying to be an activist, is is that a healthy thing for you? Is that the type of change you want to have? And then be careful because they're going to come for you next. And mm. the circular firing squad is out there. Ooh, yeah, that's a, a strong point. admonition from Jonathan Streeter. So, all right, guys, this has been awesome. We went totally went over. We're all going to have to apologize to our wives here. But it was good, and it was fun, and it was real fun. So um, we got a lot to talk about the next one. Hopefully, um, you all enjoyed it. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments, okay? I know Jonathan checks out our comments. Uh, Jonathan, how can people reach you if they want to reach out to you, my man? Uh, I'm on Facebook and on YouTube at uh, Thinker of Thoughts or Thoughts on Things and Stuff on the web. Thoughts on Things and Stuff. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up right here. We got plenty to talk about next time. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. This is Midnight Mormons. We'll see you guys in the next program. <laughs>